What's the point if we can't have fun? That's the name of this article here by David Graeber, yet again, uh, from January 2014 in The Baffler. Uh, not a whole lot of context needs to be given on this one, so I'm just going to skip that part of this. And uh, if you want to know more about David Graeber, just go watch the intro to the earlier video I did on him. Short version is he's one of my fucking favorite people uh, ever. An incredibly good writer with an amazing mind for, for contextualizing things and for uh, questioning the, the, you know, sort of conventional wisdom narrative and, and really just one of the most hopeful, optimistic writers who knows how terrible the world is and believes wholeheartedly that we can make it better, which is, I think, why I love him so much. Uh, so, yeah, this article here, not one of my favorite articles. I know that's supposed to be what this series is, but I wanted to sort of I don't know, drop this one in here, because uh, it just kind of is, is a, because of where my head's been at, basically. You know, when we were just sort of decided, basically decided, it's decided at this point, that we were switching the kind of operating question of the dailies to be from what was the most important thing that happened in the world today to, you know, what should everyone know about today. A big part of that was, you know, wanting to make it more fun, honestly. Not wanting to be such a serious, like, downer thing of, like, what was the most important thing? Which is like, yo, what, like, what, all, what great things are out there? What funny things are out there? What, what should everyone know about today? And so I, I, I thought to do this article because I remembered the title, What's the Point If We Can't Have Fun? And I was like, oh, that's, I, I, I read it long ago and I don't really, didn't really remember it that well, but it, it popped up somewhere, so I remembered it. And I just remember the title, What's the Point We Can't Have Fun? So I thought it would be this great argument for, you know, for having fun, you know, despite everything and for not taking things too seriously and, you know, enjoying stuff. And it would be great for, you know, making the case to switching to a more lighthearted thing. Turns out that's not really what this article is. It's not really a, a, an argument for having fun. It's more an argument, you know, that uh, about fun. But it is a really fascinating look at like the nature of consciousness and life and nature and how limited the perspective we have on those things is by some of the things we assume rationality requires of us. And it is ultimately like this really just sort of like, I don't want to say mind blowing, but just sort of like head cocking. Let's go with head cocking look at so much of the things that we just assume are true and, and forget to question and you know I think it's really really interesting and then it turns out it actually is a great argument for how what we're doing here is fun and and should be fun and can be fun so uh, without any further ado let's get into what's the point if we can't have fun by David Graeber here it is my friend June Thunderstorm and I once spent half an hour sitting in a meadow by a mountain lake, watching an inchworm dangle from the top of a stalk of grass, twist about in every possible direction, and then leap to the next stalk and do the same thing. And so it proceeded, in a vast circle, with what must have been a vast expenditure of energy, for what seemed like absolutely no reason at all. All animals play, June had once said to me, even ants. She'd spent many years working as a professional gardener and had plenty of incidents like this to observe and ponder. Look, she said with an air of modest triumph, see what I mean? Most of us, hearing this story, would insist on proof. How do we know the worm was playing? Perhaps the invisible circles it traced in the air were really just a search for some unknown sort of prey, or a mating ritual. Can we prove they weren't? Even if the worm was playing, how do we know this form of play did not serve some ultimately practical purpose, exercise, or self-training for some possible future inchworm emergency? This would be the reaction of most professional ethologists as well. Generally speaking, an analysis of animal behavior is not considered scientific unless the animal is assumed, at least tacitly, to be operating according to the same means and calculation that one would apply to economic transactions. Under this assumption, an expenditure of energy must be directed towards some goal, whether it be obtaining food, securing territory, achieving dominance, or maximizing reproductive success. Unless one can absolutely prove that it isn't, and absolute pro proof in such matters is, as one might imagine, 
very hard to come by. So this is, I think, really the central point of this article, right? It's this very assumption questioning thing, because everyone knows that animals play, right? Everyone who's been like within a mile of a dog park has seen animals playing. The question is why? And I think it gets it why he wanted to write this piece, because it, it transfers over to humans too. And we talked about in the last video I made about the, uh, the how to change the course of human history article that he wrote. It's the same sort of thing of like questioning what's possible and questioning, you know, all of these sort of like received wisdoms of human nature that we have bumbling around that may not be quite as true as people often treat them as they are. And he, we're going to get into later, the, you know, the sort of question of the problem of altruism. But it is, it is really very much a question, right? Like, do people do good things? because they're good? Do people help other people just to help other people? Or is it like this secret selfish thing where if you help other people it's better for you and that's why we do it? And you know, while it may seem like a mostly semantic point, it gets at this same question of what's possible. Can we live in a world where people actually care about each other? Or are we limited to a world that you know, is, is governed by people's self-interest and where we just have to balance that all out? And so I think the point he's going to try to make here is we have as, as like serious, you know, rational, reasonable people created this world for ourselves in which only selfishness, only, you know, self-interest makes sense. Only things that can be rationally explained by maximizing the outcomes of, of valued things can, can possibly exist in this world. And so one of the really cool things that he's going to do in this article, as he does in, in all of his work, is say... What if that's not the case? What if there is more that's possible? And what if we can actually live in a better world? I must emphasize here that it doesn't really matter what sort of theory of animal motivation a scientist might entertain, what she believes an animal to be thinking, or whether she thinks an animal can be said to be thinking anything at all. I'm not saying that ethologists actually believe that animals are simply rational, calculating machines. I'm simply saying that ethologists have boxed themselves into a world where to be scientific means to offer an explanation of behavior in rational terms, which in turn means describing an animal as if it were a calculating economic actor trying to maximize some sort of self-interest, whatever their theory of animal psychology or motivation might be. That's why the existence of animal play is considered something of an intellectual scandal. It's understudied, and those who do study it are seen as mildly eccentric. As with many vaguely threatening speculative notions, difficult to satisfy criteria are often introduced for proving animal play exists, and even when it is acknowledged, the research more often than not cannibalizes its own insight by trying to demonstrate that play must have some long-term survival or reproductive function. Despite all this, those who do look into the matter are invariably forced to the conclusion that play does exist across the animal universe and exists not just among such notoriously frivolous creatures as monkeys, dolphins, or puppies, but among such unlikely species as frogs, minnows, salamanders, fiddler crabs, and yes, even ants, which not only engage in frivolous activities as individuals, but have also been observed since the 19th century to arrange mock wars, apparently just for the fun of it. Why do animals play? Well, why shouldn't they? The real question is, why does the existence of action carried out for the sheer pleasure of acting, the exertion of powers for the sheer pleasure of exerting them, strike us as mysterious? What does it tell us about ourselves that we instinctively assume that it is? So I think that's a really interesting question, and it reminds me of this documentary series by one of my favorite documentarians, Adam Curtis, who works for the BBC. It's called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, and you know, it's, the description says, a series of films about how culture itself has been colonized by the machines it has built. So basically it's about how the nature of computers shape societies and how their limits translate into limits on society itself. 
So if you think about it, like, you know, for me, like the experience of like taking a survey, I've always hated taking surveys because I find myself like totally torn between two wildly different answers or maybe like unsure of exactly how to interpret an ambiguous question. And so I'm never, it's never like, ah, oh, yes, this one is like exactly the thing that I feel. It's always like, oh, I'm sort of between these two, but then you have to choose one. And so you pick the one and then you're over here, but you're like, ah, oh, but I kind of, and then the person looking at it just sees you over here and they're like, oh, well, everyone feels this way when in fact we were kind of torn between the two you know there's there, there's there's very uh, computers need very clear categories and very precisely demarcated boundaries right but so much of, of experience exists in the liminal spaces between categories. So much of life is, is touchy-feely experiences that can't be distilled down to like a single value for something. And so if you think about like how much of society is shaped by you know computers processing data and, and decisions made based on that processed data, not necessarily even just by humans, right? Like looking at the data, but even when you look at all the like recommendation engines and algorithms that determine you know so much of society these days they are limited by machines that can't really grasp all the texture and complexity of you know the the responses and the data that they're dealing with and I think that's you know to come back to, to Graeber's point I think that's part of how we ended up with this purely rational self-interest maximizing view of life because that's what would make sense to a computer, right? That's what makes sense to a computer model, to a simulation. And, and you know, maybe not like literally in this case that, that that's what's happening, that they had to explain, you know, animal play to a computer. And so it, it came up with this explanation. But that so much of our, our ways of thinking have been shaped by this need to filter data into a computer that it has put us in this position where, you know, we see humans as rational economic actors and we see animals as machines trying to maximize their self-interest. And there's no space for, you know, play or, or like the joy of, of doing things. And I know, you know, an economist is going to say, oh, well, there's a preference for leisure and all that sort of stuff. I, I understand that. I'm just saying that, you know, that... There is a difference between, oh, well, I have a preference for leisure and I have a preference for consumption and I have a preference and preference and preference and, and this sort of like gooey, blurred line understanding of like, well, we kind of like, you know, a bunch of weird stuff all the time. And so I think, you know, that's kind of when he says, what does it tell us about ourselves that we instinctively assume that it is? That's my response, right, is that we have been limited by our by machines the machines that do so much for us they've also limited us in how we can see the world and when we were talking a minute ago about you know the limited view of what's possible that, that this has left us with i think that's a huge part of that anyways survival of the misfits the tendency in popular thought to view the biological world in economic terms was present at the 19th century beginnings of Darwinian science. Charles Darwin, after all, borrowed the term survival of the fittest from the sociologist Herbert Spencer, that darling of robber barons. Spencer, in turn, was struck by how much the forces driving natural selection in On the Origin of Species jived with his own laissez-faire economic theories. Competition over resources, rational calculation of advantage, and the gradual extinction of the weak were taken to be the prime directives of the universe. So this Herbert Spencer fellow is actually a pretty interesting guy. Uh, here he is. He was born in 1820, died in 1903. He was a philosopher, biologist, anthropologist, sociologist, and prominent classical liberal political theorist of the Victorian era. All this coming from Wikipedia, by the way. And so, yeah, he coined the phrase survival of the fittest and came up with this universal theory of life that was governed by evolution, where business, politics, all that jazz is determined by natural selection. Apparently, he was, like, wildly popular in England at the time. And then around 1900, his influence just, like, died off. And, and you know, in, like, the 1920s and 30s, everyone's like, oh, who cares about that guy anymore? Which I don't really have an explanation for, but just spitballing. You know, as we talked about with the Matt Stoller article, uh, in, in the 20s and 30s, there's this very sh major shift in the way society uh, 
is uh, with the way power is arranged in society with the business titans and the the robber barons and the you know republican establishment falling and being replaced by this new deal coalition you know of democrats and workers and farmers and all that and so it kind of makes sense to me that in the very business dominated world this idea of everything you know social darwinism basically that everything is survival to fittest dominates and and a thinker who you know promotes ideas like that is very popular and then as the zeitgeist sort of shifts over to being more worker friendly more you know about like society and collective action and all that it, it sort of drops by the wayside so interesting guy this herbert spencer the stakes of this new view of nature as the theater for a brutal struggle for existence were high and objections registered very early on an alternative school of Darwinism emerged in Russia, emphasizing cooperation, not competition, as the driver of evolutionary change. In 1902, this approach found a voice in a popular book, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, by naturalist and revolutionary anar anarchist pamphleteer Peter Kropotkin. In an explicit repost to social Darwinists, Kropotkin argued that the entire theoretical basis for social Darwinism was wrong. Those species that cooperate most effectively tend to be the most competitive in the long run. Kropotkin, born a prince, he renounced his title as a young man, spent many years in Siberia as a naturalist and explorer before being imprisoned for revolutionary agitation, escaping and fleeing to London. Mutual aid grew from a series of essays written in response to Thomas Henry Huxley, a well-known social Darwinist, and summarized the Russian understanding of the day, which was that while competition was undoubtedly one factor driving both natural and social evolution, the role of cooperation was ultimately decisive. So we got to take a minute to talk about Peter Kropotkin, because he is one of the most treasured thinkers on the left in the anarchist world. He's known affectionately as Bread Santa, and uh, I imagine you can figure out the Santa part from looking at him. His most famous book is The Conquest of Bread, which is about sort of how feudalism and, and a lot, I, to be honest, I haven't read it, and I'm not going to try to summarize it for you, but it's basically about... Uh, you know, equality and anarchism and better systems of organizing economies. Anyways, as Graeber pointed out, he was born in Moscow to an ancient Russian princely family of the Rurik dynasty, which ruled Russia before the Romanovs. And his father was this, like, major general in the military who owned, like, a ton of land and had 1,200 serfs. But at 12, uh, Peter had, like, fallen under the sway of some Republican thinkers or something, and so he renounced his title. Then at 14, he enrolls in what's this, like, elite military school slash, like, court training program uh, that, like, only 150 kids get to go into, and they're all, you know, children of, of famous, important people. But he was hazed a lot, and he really hates it. Uh, after graduating, he graduates top of his class, and because of he was in the school and he did really well, he gets to choose, you know, when he goes into the military, he gets to choose what he wants to do, basically. He chooses to be a Cossack in eastern Siberia. The Cossacks are actually an interesting group. I, I didn't know much about them, but I was just quickly looking at their Wikipedia page uh, to figure out what was, you know, going on with that. Apparently, they're this, like, democratic, really interestingly organized uh, military unit, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So he serves under some liberal commanders who introduce him to some prominent anarchists in the area. And then they give him a bunch of like scientific assignments like geographic surveying and things like that. Then in 67, he retires from the military, resigns from the military, which makes his father really mad. And that's how he gets disinherited. That's how he loses, you know, the real claim to, to everything. 72, he visits Switzerland and joins the International Workingmen's Association, but he didn't like their style of socialism, and that led him to explore some different groups in Switzerland and Geneva, and he decides he's an anarchist. He then goes back to Russia and starts agitating and passing out revolutionary propaganda, which gets him arrested. Uh, a few years later, though, after being in jail, just before his trial, he escapes and flees to England. This is a great little story. On, after he escapes, he meets up with some friends, and they decide to hide by dining in one of the fanciest restaurants in St. Petersburg, assuming that the police won't look for them there. And they're right. 
So he, go, he gets to England, stays for a little while, moves to Switzerland. Uh, you know, he was only visiting before. He moves to Switzerland. Joins one of the anarchist groups he liked a lot, but he gets kicked out, uh, from Swi- out of Switzerland pretty quickly for, you know, revolutionary agitation and all that. And he ends up bouncing around for a long time, just sort of like being a revolutionary and distributing literature and pamphlets and things. Then finally, after the Russian Revolution in 1917, he goes back. Uh, but he doesn't really like the Bolsheviks and their style of state socialism, so he kind of becomes, even still, a, a revolutionary agitator. And eventually he dies of pneumonia on February 8th, 1921. And actually his funeral would be one of the last public demonstrations of anarchists in Soviet Russia. It was like even blessed by Vladimir Lenin because he was such a like, you know, well-regarded dude that he let, they let the anarchists come and protest. So definitely worth looking deeper into him and checking out his whole legacy and body of work if you're interested. Again, Mr. Bread Santa right there, Peter Kropotkin. But coming back to the text a little bit, let's consider this this distinction between com- competition and cooperation, right? Because if everything is competition and it's, you know, this vicious war of all against all, it demands peak efficiency, right? Every, every action, every natural system needs to be designed to make everyone as efficient as possible so they can outcompete and survive. But if, competi- if cooperation wins out, the value system is very different. And honestly, I don't even, like... I, I, we spend as a society so little time talking about cooperation that I don't even know how to explain like oh the values and the the things that win in a world where cooperation is the driving thing, right? It feels like it's this very different thing where what matters and what's good and and what determines survival is very different from efficiency. And obviously, efficiency is such a vague concept; it can mean anything. But the, you know, the idea of maximizing certain resources and, and values doesn't make as much sense if you're trying to build group cohesion and, and cooperation as opposed to competition. So again, by reframing things from competition to cooperation, it really changes the sorts of lifestyles and societies and, and systems that are possible, right? The Russian challenge was taken quite seriously in 20th century biology, particularly among the emerging subdiscipline of evolutionary psychology, even if it was rarely mentioned by name. It came, instead, to be subsumed under the broader problem of altruism, another phrase borrowed from the economists and one that spills over into arguments among rational choice theorists in the social sciences. This was the question that already troubled Darwin, Why should animals ever sacrifice their individual advantage for others? Because no one can deny that they sometimes do. Why should a herd animal draw potentially lethal attention to himself by alerting his fellows a predator is coming? Why should worker bees kill themselves to protect their hive? If to advance a scientific explanation of any behavior means to attribute rational maximizing motives, then what, precisely, was a kamikaze bee trying to maximize? I just want to underline one point about this problem of altruism that I kind of hinted at earlier. It's that, you know, I think one of the major drivers of human behavior is you're not better than me, right? It's a very, I, I catch myself doing it all the time. I'm sure everyone else does it too where you're presented with someone who's doing some amazing thing and you're like, wow, that's really crazy. And it makes you feel bad about yourself. And so then you start like picking apart everything they do and you have to like, you know, break down, oh, well, he's actually duh, 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 duh. Or, you know, okay, but he didn't have to duh, 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 duh. And you have to get yourself to a point where it's like, okay, he's not better than me. And then you can go about your life again, <laughs> you know? And and I think it's, it's a very important point here when we talk about the problem of altruism because again, it, it could be seen as just a, superficial semantic thing right either you know okay well you can express uh, altruism as a form of self-interest or you can express it as a form as just pure altruism but it doesn't really make a difference right it's the same basic thing but when you bring in this idea of you're not better than me it it, it matters right because if your altruism is just convoluted self-interest then you're not better than me. And it's okay for me to just be selfish too because, well, that person who's not being selfish, they actually are and everyone's selfish and there's no reason for me to change. You're not better than me. But if it's actual altruism, if it's an actual thing where people can care about other people and act you know, for other people's sake, yeah, it makes them happy, but they're doing it for other people's sake, then that's a very different thing. And you know, 
maybe perhaps just going to throw it out there, a better thing. We all know the eventual answer, which the discovery of genes made possible. Animals were simply trying to maximize the propagation of their own genetic codes. Curiously, this view, which eventually came to be referred to as Neo-Darwinian, was developed largely by figures who considered themselves radicals of some sort or another. Jack Haldane, a Marxist biologist, was already trying to annoy moralists in the 1930s by quipping that, like any biological entity, he'd be happy to sacrifice his life for two brothers or eight cousins. The epitome of this line of thought came with militant atheist Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, a work that insisted all biological entities were best conceived of as lumbering robots, programmed by genetic codes that, for some reason no one could quite explain, acted like successful Chicago gangsters, ruthlessly expanding their territory in an endless desire to propagate themselves. Such, such descriptions were typically qualified by remarks like, of course, this is just a metaphor, genes don't really want or do anything. But in reality, the neo-Darwinists were practically driven to their conclusions by their initial assumption, that science demands a rational explanation, that this means attributing rational motives to all behavior, and that a truly rational motivation can only be one that, if observed in humans, would normally be described as selfishness or greed. As a result, the neo-Darwinists went even further than the Victorian variety. If old-school social Darwinists like Herbert Spencer viewed nature as a marketplace, albeit an unusually cutthroat one, the new version was outright capitalist. The neo-Darwinists assumed not just a struggle for survival, but a universe of rational calculation driven by an apparently irrational imperative to unlimited growth. So real quick, I just want to point out that this guy, Jack Haldane, that he mentions is a British Indian scientist. And this is, he was born in 1892, so well before Indian independence. Uh, and he's actually the guy who came up with the primordial soup theory that was the foundation to build physical models for the chemical origin of life. So cool dude, this Jack Haldane character. Also, like, just look at the guy. <laughs> this, anyway, is how the Russian challenge was understood. Kropotkin's actual argument is far more interesting. Much of it, for instance, is concerned with how animal cooperation often has nothing to do with survival or reproduction, but is a form of pleasure in itself. To take flight in flocks merely for pleasure is quite common among all sorts of birds, he writes. Kropotkin multiplies examples of social play, pairs of vultures wheeling about for their own entertainment, hares so keen to box with other species that they occasionally, and unwisely, approach foxes. Flocks of birds performing military-style maneuvers, bands of squirrels coming together for wrestling and similar games. We know at the present time that all animals, beginning with the ants, going on to the birds, and ending with the highest mammals, are fond of plays. Wrestling, running after each other, trying to capture each other, teasing each other, and so on. And while many plays are, so to speak, a school for the proper behavior of young and mature life, there are others which, apart from their utilitarian purposes, are together with dancing and singing mere manifestations of an excess of forces, the joy of life, and a desire to communicate in some way or another with other individuals of the same or of other species. In short, a manifestation of sociability proper, which is a distinctive feature of all the animal world. To exercise one's capacities to their fullest extent is to take pleasure in one's own existence. And with sociable creatures, such pleasures are proportionally magnified when performed in company. From the, Russian, from the Russian perspective, this does not need to be explained. It is simply what life is. We don't have to explain why creatures desire to be alive. Life is an end in itself. And if what being alive actually consists of is having powers to, to run, jump, fight, fly through the air, then surely the exercise of such powers as an end in itself does not have to be explained either. It's just an extension of the same principle. Which is his point, right? That when you change your perspective from everything being about competition and survival to everything being about cooperation and, and a more joyful life, 
that the things that are possible change. If you assume that only that which is purely efficient can survive, then of course you can only see what is purely efficient. Friedrich Schiller had already argued in 1795 that it was precisely in play that we find the origins of self-consciousness, and hence freedom, and hence morality. Man plays only when he is in the full sense of the word a man, Schiller wrote in his On the Aesthetic Education of Man, and he is only wholly a man when he is playing. If so, and if Kropotkin was right, then glimmers of freedom, or even of moral life, begin to appear everywhere around us. It's hardly surprising, then, that this aspect of Kropotkin's argument was ignored by the neo-Darwinists. Unlike the problem of altruism, cooperation for pleasure, as an end in itself, simply could not be recuperated for ideological purposes. In fact, the version of the struggle for existence that emerged over the 20th century had even less room for play than the older Victorian one. Herbert Spencer himself had no problem with the idea of animal play as purposeless, a mere enjoyment of surplus energy. Just as a successful industrialist or salesman could go home and play a nice game of cribbage or polo, why should those animals that succeeded in the struggle for existence not also have a bit of fun? But in the new, full-blown capitalist version of evolution, where the drive for accumulation had no limits, life was no longer an end in itself, but a mere instrument for the propagation of DNA sequences, and so the very existence of play was something of a scandal. So he's making two points here that I want to highlight. The first is fairly straightforward. It's this idea that, you know, unlike the problem of altruism, cooperation for pleasure couldn't be recuperated for ideological purposes. In other words, you know, playing, the idea that playing is just plain fun doesn't make anybody rich. You can't use it to motivate your workers or to justify, you know, an unequal society. It's, there's no benefit to the to power structure to believe in, you know, playing just for pleasure's sake. Second one, I, I, I think he, he sort of misses a trick here, which is, you know, he, he points out that the scientific vision of play got much harsher over the 20th century, right? He goes, you know, Herbert Spencer himself had no problem with the idea of animal play as purposeless, uh, but in the new full-blown capitalist version, uh, life was no longer an end in itself, but a mere instrument for the propagation of DNA sequences. So we get this much harsher vision of the world developing over the 20th century, which if you look at the 20th century, makes sense, right? You got those world wars in there. And the first one in particular is very much this moment where the sort of like lofty idealistic vision of war as something like, you know, game that nobles play where they just move pieces around the board and it's just this fun little thing smashes up against modernity in World War I and war suddenly becomes this like utterly terrifying civilization destroying like inconceivable horror. And so if you think of, you know, that sort of tectonic shift in the world from this, this, you know, world where nobles are playing at war and, you know, power is just this game to this like, oh shit, millions of people are dying left and right thing. It kind of makes sense that notions of play would go out the window too, right? And I, I, I don't... I, I just want to tie it to this idea, you know, World War I, the beginning of World War I is so terrible because there's all these generals and soldiers with these notions of honor and these beautiful idealized notions that go by the wayside. And I wonder if play is how, how those two things are wrapped up in each other, right? It's just an interesting thought. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave you guys for this one. It's going to be a two-part series this time, so not a whole lot left. We're at the halfway mark, but I'm going to leave you right here. That was a lot of stuff about what play is, but in part two, we're going to talk a lot about a lot of things. We're going to get consciousness, free will, freedom, uh, the soul, whether computers can play. So stick around. I'll see you guys in the next one.